All right, this is our rhetoric and writing video for week seven. Got lots of stuff to cover this week. Um, important things, more more kind of the nuts and bolts, and not so much about how to write an argument. We've been talking about some of that and persuasion the last few weeks, but this is really just uh, some of the things that you have to do when you're writing for an English class or a humanities class because we use what's called MLA format. Now, for other classes that you might take, definitely recommend that you always consult with the professor. Um, if you're in a science class or a psychology class and you have to write a paper, they might use APA, which is a different format, but there's still requirements for that. And, and if you have the Heartbrace Essentials book, we both we have both MLA and APA format in there. And there's other formats too, one called Chicago Style and others. So you always want to check with your professor. Some of them won't be very specific or, um, you know, they may be fine if you just, oh yeah, just follow MLA or whatever you're comfortable with. But you always want to find out. Lots of professors will put that in their assignments so you can see it. But again, just something to think about. But for our class for the rest of the semester, I want to make sure that you try to adhere to the stuff we talk about today. And again, this is all in the Harbrace book, so you can find out more about it. Before we even get into the formatting, we're going to talk about sources, and that's also an important part. It's really connected to formatting. So let's do that first. Um, this is on page 69 uh, to 80 in the Harbrace book. Um, and, and basically, just up front, let me just say, this class does not require that you do research. You're not required to do research. but um, you can definitely bring in outside sources beyond what I recommend or the readings if you want to. That's that's fine, but it's not required. We're not writing a research paper. Um, and of course, you may also be asked to do research in other classes. So this is going to come up. And one of the things we do in the English department, I think, is try to prepare students to handle the writing that they have to do in their other classes as well as what, what we do in the English department. So let's look at this. A um, couple of things to know about sources is most likely you're going to be asked to use uh, secondary sources for any research you might do as an undergraduate, in other words, before the bachelor's degree. So um, anything you would do at Morton is likely going to be secondary sources. And that means these are commentaries on, descriptions, or things of primary sources. And it can include reports, reviews, summaries, scholarly biographies, collections of work, etc. Um, primary sources may include, like, if you had to say, like, oh, I want to, I have to research, uh, um, the, the great writer, um, um, I'm spacing his name right now, uh, William Faulkner that we were talking about earlier. So I'm going to travel down to University of Mississippi and I'm going to look through the archive letters. You know, again, that's something usually not an undergrad's going to do. If you're a graduate student, you're working on your master's or your PhD in English or history, you might do something like that. Um, historical records, papers, artwork, photographs, video recordings. Um, and so you see at the bottom of the page, if you can see the screen, we've got this book. This is The Killing of a President about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And that is a, you know, that's a book that was written after, long time after the uh, president was assassinated. Over here we have the, I think it's the Evening Sentinel. I can't think what paper that is, but it's the headline, President Kennedy, you know, was assassinated. And um, so that was that was written at the time, but it's still a commentary on what happened. And then here in the middle, this is a film strip. And, you know, in 1963, um, nobody had a phone. I mean, we had landlines. People had land. I wasn't born yet, but people had landlines. And, um, it's, you know, if, if the president were assassinated today, there'd be a thousand films of it at least because everybody would have their phone out filming as he went by. But in this case, there was only one that they know of. It was a guy named Abraham Zapruder. So that film became really important when they were doing the investigation of President Kennedy's assassination. And... This is a, a clip from that, you know, a photograph of a clip from that. And um, they watched that over and over. They used it when they did what's called the Warren Commission to try to sort of prove. Um, and and by the way, if you're interested in this topic, my gosh, there's so much. I, I don't know if there's been anything that there's been more theories about, you know, and some people call them conspiracy theories about how the president was assassinated or who assassinated him. Of course, it was decided by the Warren Commission that it was a man named Lee Harvey Oswald that acted by himself. But. Lots and lots. There's a movie out. Uh, Oliver Stone is, is a famous one who questions this a lot. And he just did a documentary recently, which is pretty interesting stuff. Um, but anyway, the reason I bring this up is not to, not to engage in uh, theories about conspiracies or anything, but to talk about primary and secondary sources. So this would be a primary uh, source, this Abraham Zapruder film, because it was an actual thing that was recorded at the scene of the president being assassinated. Uh, you know, that is like a letter, artwork, you know, video. Uh, again, you're not likely to have to use those, but I like to make that distinction really clear because if your teacher does say primary sources, you better you better clarify that with them and make sure. The, the one place I could see that happening is maybe you're in a, 
a nursing class and you have to go out and talk to it, you know, other nurses or, or do reports or something. So it could happen, but generally we're going to do secondary sources. They're going to be books and things like this, The Killing of a President, which was written way after the president was assassinated. It was not, a, you know, either the day of or a film made during the uh, assassination. So again, secondary sources are mainly what we're going to use, um, books, biographies, reviews, and so on. Another question to ask if you have to do a research paper, and again, I know there are certain classes like psychology, I'm very familiar with uh, Psychology 101, they usually write a research paper, history, humanities often do that too. Um, when writing about, um, you know, are you, are you asked to use current up-to-date sources? What does that mean? How recent? Does that mean in the last three years, five years? Um, or does it, can it be fine just to be older sources? Now, usually, um, you know, that, that's going to depend on your subject. If you're in a very tech heavy, you're writing in a computer science class, you probably want to have very up-to-date stuff. If you're in a history class and it's a history of the American Civil War, it may not matter as, as much because, you know, even though the, the, the writing has changed, we, you know, we know what we know based on, on that for the most part. Um, bias and unbiased this is a very important one, very difficult one. I would just say, you know, unbiased is obviously um, uh, something that supports your position, and, but it treats all points fairly. It's not totally biased in favor of one thing or another. And this, this can be hard. Um, when you're out there searching on the Internet, it, you know, it's hard to sort through this. So what I always recommend in or, in a way to avoid bias sources that when I say bias, what I mean is just they bring other viewpoints or, or demonstrate certain ways of discussing an issue that are faulty in some way. It's almost like logical fallacies. I think we talked about last week, but it's, it's more than that. It's basically just showing that, um, the sources is, is not, uh, treating all points fairly, but we have databases at the library. So if you have to do a research paper, I would recommend either getting the help of a, one of our reference librarians who are very willing to help, um, with this kind of stuff, or just going into the library website. We have databases on lots of subjects that those are going to be what are called peer reviewed for the most part. And that means that experts in that field read those papers before they were published or those articles. So again, trying to find unbiased sources is really important when you're doing any kind of research. Um, how do you find sources? Well, again, the library databases, that's my favorite go-to. Uh, we just, you know, these days when I was in, in college, I would go to the library, I would pour through the stacks and just look for books. And, you know, we had like a card catalog. I think they still have that. I don't know, but so much these days is done digitally and online, of course. So that's where I would start. If I were doing any kind of research, find your sources through the library databases. You have access to those as a student. I have access as faculty and most people don't. Um, if you're not affiliated with a university or a college, you don't have these databases because they're very expensive to maintain and, and the subscription prices are way beyond what most of us would want to pay. So, but, and all that's available to you just because you're a student at Morton. So if you have to do any kind of research, uh, you can find a lot of stuff there. So including genealogy, I think if you're just interested in that, I think there's a lot of uh, references there. But anyway, uh, you know, articles, obviously you can go to journals, magazines, newspapers, you can check. Our library is kind of in a flux right now because it's being moved. So it's difficult. But again, if you can work with a reference librarian to help you with this, and in a few months by spring for sure, I think the library will be back in its normal spot. And then you can have a lot easier time actually going in, talking to somebody face to face and getting help. Again, if you have a research project, there are librarians that that's what they're there for. They really want to help people. And I've some librarians over the years that I've known have said students don't always make use of them. And when the library is back in full swing, like next in the spring, or if it makes it online by the time we're at the end of the semester, I want to, you know, make sure my students have a tour. Doesn't really help if you're an online, but maybe maybe I'll figure something out. We can talk to a, a reference librarian because it can be really helpful as you do any research for other classes. Keeping track of your sources, if you're doing a big research paper, something that goes on for half the semester, you know, like you turn it in midterm, you work on it and turn it as a final, you're, you're going to accumulate a lot of information. So you really need a system, <clears throat> pardon me, some way to keep track of all that stuff. I think that's something I learned in graduate school because you just have to be organized with these papers. And so there's lots of ways to do that. You can bookmark the uh, URLs in your computer if you're using a computer or tablet. Um, the library has accounts that they can help you organize stuff. So that's another thing you could check with a, a reference librarian. You can just download everything and, and build files in your computer, or if you're using Google Drive, you can do that. But again, the, the old fashioned way is to photocopy, print out, uh, staple, and keep things all in a folder. That's totally fine too. Whatever works. Some people like the print, you know, having something they can touch, uh, but it's up to you. But if you're doing a big research paper, again, not for our class, but I'm just trying to help you prepare for later classes. Um, 
try to keep track of those sources in some way, have a way to organize them. You probably, again, aren't going to be asked to do field research. That's more like where we get our primary sources, where you go out and survey somebody or do interviews on the phone or send emails out to try to get uh, survey, you know, survey questions answered or make a video conference and record that transcript. All these kinds of things are, are research techniques, observations. You might do that if you're in an early childhood class or nursing, you might observe somebody in the field and take notes about that and analyze it. Uh, but again, that's just another kind of research. So uh, we are going to do, an, uh, usually we do an activity called uh, an indoxa activity, which is a kind of research activity. So we'll see if we'll do that. But generally, you're not doing primary research, but field research, but you might be. You never know. It depends on the class. So it's good to know uh, a little bit about what that is. All right. So let's get to the last part of this. It's going to take a bit, but I hope you'll stay with me because this is really an important part of putting your paper together for the rest of the semester, each essay that you write. I'm gonna be looking at these pretty closely. I've already been making some suggestions in your papers, but for now, I'm gonna really expect that you um, are obviously avoiding plagiarism and acknowledging your sources. Here are all the pages where we get that in uh, the Hard Brace book. So there's three ways you can avoid plagiarism. And by the way, I guess I should say, what is plagiarism? Just in case you're not familiar with that term, um, plagiarism is using somebody else's ideas and not giving them credit. So even, you know, this can take a lot of forms. If you saw somebody on a TV show and then you mentioned it in a paper, you'd still somehow want to cite that source. But usually we do it in other ways. We either directly quote someone, we use paraphrase where we use someone else's uh, ideas, but we don't use their exact words. And we use summaries where we do the same thing. We use their ideas, and, but we also shrink it down, condense it a lot. So these are the three ways that we can acknowledge sources. Probably there are other ways, but these are the three ways that we mainly do in academic writing. So let's look at a couple of examples. So here's one that's more related to the springtime. So depending on when you're watching this video, uh, but direct quotations to highlight specific passages and when you want um, to do one of the following things. So you wanna highlight the specific passage, but you also might wanna retain the beauty or clarity of someone's words. In other words, that person just said it way better than I'm ever gonna be able to, I might as well just use their words because I'm just gonna butcher it. I feel that way sometimes. Um, Reveal how the reasoning in a specific passage is insightful or flawed and discuss the quoted material's implications. These are just reasons why you would want to use a direct quotation. And the big reason is because you're trying to support your thesis, right? You're trying to, trying to show um, uh, and prove your main point. This is a quote from a poet named T.S. Eliot, one of my favorites, who grew up in St. Louis, which is just a little south of us, right? But they still have some pretty Midwestern type winters. So he grew up knowing what winter is. And one of the things I always say, I don't mind winter in January, December, February even. But when it's April, I start to get really tired of winter. And sometimes in Chicago, it seems like in April, we're still having winter. That's how it feels to me. I grew up in the South. <laughs> but um, So he said, April is the cruelest month. In other words, he, this poem goes on to talk about how you think it's just getting like spring is here and then boom, we get hit with another freeze or something like that. He doesn't, he says it poetically. So I say it like very conversationally. But anyway, that's a quotation. I would use that in a poem, um, or rather that quote from a poem in a paper, if I was trying to explain what I just said. All that stuff I just said about he grew up in St. Louis, um, April seems like the winter's going on too long. He just simply says April's the cruelest month. So there's beauty to me, clarity, simplicity in his language. So I would go with that. I would use a direct quotation. But sometimes you don't, you know, for whatever reason, paraphrase is also good. And that's when you use uh, the ideas, like let's say I want to use T.S. Eliot's ideas according to T.S. Eliot. Now I still, notice I still give credit. A direct quotation, we give credit, right? But I also give credit even if I'm just paraphrasing what he said. So sometimes that gets left out, and but it's still a form of plagiarism because I'm still using his ideas pretty clearly. And according to T.S. Eliot, April can be a difficult time of year, especially if you're in the Midwest, right? So we use paraphrase when we want to clarify difficult material by making it simpler. Maybe he said it in a way, I think April is the cruelest month, it's pretty clear, but maybe it's too complex. Sometimes you're reading a science book or, you know, um, whatever, and you want to make it simpler. So paraphrase is a great way. You put it in your own words, make it simple, but you still express what they were trying to say. You want to use their ideas, but not their exact words for whatever reason. You want to create a consistent tone for your work. So if you do a lot of quoting direct, and if the language is kind of strange, it kind of makes your paper sound a little disjointed or not fitting together. And so again, doing quotes sparingly, we can paraphrase, and then that keeps the tone. It's our tone as the writer. You want to interact with a point from one of your sources. So again, paraphrase sort of shows that you're thinking about it and that you're even able to put it into your own words and you're interacting with it. You're really 
maybe even shaping it a little bit, but you're still using their ideas. The last thing we can do is we can summarize. So this poem that the quote came from, it's called The Wasteland. It's a cheerful sounding poem, right? And um, um, sarcasm. And in T.S. Eliot's poem, you can see at the bottom here, I'm gonna summarize. In T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, the author combines ideas from the Holy Grail legend, Shakespeare, Dante, and many other sources to explore themes of disillusionment and despair. This seems perfect for Halloween. I don't know, it sounds a little, almost you know, sad and spooky a little bit, and it kind of is, but this is a summary, right? I kind of summarized the whole, maybe main idea of this long poem, and I did that because I wanted to present his ideas in a brief fashion. So I just wanted to tell you, this is basically what The Wasteland is. It's very dark, depressing. It draws on all these famous uh, poets and writers and images from the past, and it basically ends up with a lot of disillusionment and despair. Um, that's my summary. <laughs> Provides an overview of a complex idea. So this is very complicated. If you read through the poem, you might not see that right away, but hopefully my summary helps it to be more clear. Show your understanding. So if a professor reads this that I'd written, they might say, oh, Tom really, he, he gets some idea at least of this poem. And so that's what we do with summary. So those are three ways that you can um, make sure that you're not plagiarized when you write a paper. In other words, make sure you, you're using your own words. Plagiarism is pretty serious. If you look at the student handbook, um, people can be expelled from college for, for using others. So we take it very seriously in academia. Um, and so it's something you really want to pay attention to. And here's three ways you can avoid that in any class. You can use uh, quotations, summaries, and paraphrase. And you're still using those other ideas. Now, when you use, I want to say a little more about quotations, because this can be very hard. When you use quotations, there's a couple of rules around that. The most important one, I think, probably, is that you use what are called attributive tags. Sometimes these are called also signal phrases. And you can see the main thing. It's a tag or it's a signal that now I'm not speaking for myself. I'm quoting somebody, right? It sets it up. In the publication, Cybersecurity Today, Chris Allen states, so we say Chris Allen's name, and we say he states. Right there, we start our quotation. We have a quotation, like a comma, and then a quotation mark usually, right? According to Allen, now notice the difference in these two, if you're, if you're following here. I know there's a lot of information today. But the first one, we mention the publication. And the first time you mention something in a paper, if you haven't mentioned it before, you want to mention where you found it. So in the short story, the sun also, or uh, the short story, um, gosh, I'm a temporary matter. Uh, Lahir, Jump, Jump Lahiri says, right? So the first time we mention her short story, we want to mention the title and not just the story because you want to assume that you're writing for a wider audience than just your professor. So obviously I know what story we read, but you still want to mention that title and the author's name. Now, the second time you mention it, you can just say, according to Lahiri, and you can just mention her name, right? Even her last name. We don't usually use people's first name. I notice sometimes students will do that. They'll say, according to Jumpa, it, you know, that's fine, but we're not really on a first name basis with, uh, with our, with our sources usually. It, you want it to be more formal. And it's, it may sound kind of artificial. Like, would you really say Lahiri? That sounds like a, a coach in high school who would always call me by my last name. Hey, Pierce, right? But that's what we do in academic writing. We want to use that last name, not first name, unless you're using both, right? You can say Jumpa Lahiri, Chris Allen. But if we're just using one, just according to Alan, in Alan's views. On page 94 of the Harbrace Essentials book, there's a long list of different ways. If you get tired of saying states or says, there's lots of ways you can do this. But when you're quoting, make sure you mention the, the writer and where their, where their work appears, uh, the publication or the title of the story or whatever it is. And then also, um, you know, you have that tag that they said that or they stated that. Here's just a couple of examples of how you would do that. Martha Graham famously said, comma, here's our quotation, period, and then end quotation. That's the end of the sentence. Dance is the hidden language of the soul. You can reverse it if you want to. Dance is the hidden language of the soul. Comma goes inside the quotations, and then period. Um, so again, there's, this is important. We're going to talk more about it as we go through the semester. Um, uh, but it, the main thing you want to do, however you do it, you can even put your tag, your signal phrase right in the middle. Um, writes Martha Graham, and then we put the rest of the quote there. So there's lots of ways to do that. We're going to talk about a couple more things here. This is really also um, to do with how you put your paper together. So this is stuff that I will expect on you know future papers. So MLA formats on page uh, around page 114 to 165. There's tons of information there. So I'm just going to give you some really basic stuff because you don't want to wade through that many pages probably. But this will tell you some of the things that if you do these minimum four things, your papers will be formatted for my class well enough. Uh, for MLA formatting. 
There's a sample paper I'm looking at on page 46, and then also another one on page 155 if you want to just see what it looks like. The one on 155 is pretty long because it's a research paper. So that one's a, it's a good example, but it's, it's way longer than anything we're going to do. The one on page, um, where's it, page 45 is uh, a shorter paper, still pretty good, good length, I think, um, but more of an essay like we might be doing. Now, so if you'll notice right away at the top, there's a heading. You have the student name, Billy Lucas. You have the professor's name, you have the course name and number, and you have the date. And notice the way the date is formatted kind of weird, but that's the way MLA likes it. Again, this is just something that a bunch of nerdy English teachers got together and decided this is the way it wanted, they wanted it to be done. And, and it's applied to lots and lots of uh, academic writing. Um, everybody who uses MLA format. But notice that the, the date, the actual day uh, number, so 14 April 2017, there are no commas there. And then there's a title, and the title's kind of centered in the paper, right? And then notice as you go through, we're going to talk about this later, but this first part's indented. But the main thing is you want to have a, a heading and a title. For our class, if you just want to put um, essay number three, I'm okay with that. I just want you to get used to the formatting. Um, if you want to title it, that's great, too. If you have a nice title, it always get, kind of gets interest. So essay number three is kind of dry, kind of boring, right? Um, but maybe... Maybe something more like responsibility and freedom or something. You know, you have some title that goes along with the with the subject. So that's good to have that. Um, lines and paragraphs. So you'll notice here, each all these are double space, and that's really much easier on the eyes. I think that's the main reason MLA does that. It's just easier to read. Um, it looks nice. And then we indent. So notice this first line. There's an indention right there. Uh, you can use it. This is, I think this is probably Times New Roman. There's lots of common fonts that we use, but try to use one that's a kind of doesn't look strange. It looks like a normal typeface. Um, uh, Arial, uh, Times New Roman, Calibri, that should be Times. And any of those are good, but double spaced and then indenting the first of each part. When you're quoting, integrating these quotations, you might get a little message sometimes in your paper where I said float. And it's basically a floating quotation is not integrated into the paper. So to do a good quotation like we just talked about, but this is just showing you in a little more um, what it looks like on a, on a paper, include a signal phrase. So Robert L. Moore calls slang. So Robert, Robert L. Moore calls, right? There's our signal phrase, a notoriously slippery concept. Very short quote. Because we mentioned his name, we just put the page number here, right? 61. Summarizing several definitions of slang, he states. Now we don't even have to say it. We're still talking about Robert L. Moore, right? And we have the quote, and again, we know who it is. Um, and here we have our page number. Among these traits are the idea that slang is usually spoken instead of written. Now, now we're talking about somebody else and we're not quoting directly. This is more like a summary, right? We summarize these ideas and we have to mention the author's name, Haman, and it's on page 77 of his book. How do we know which book? We have to have a, uh, sources cited at the end of the paper. And the idea that slang is a response to a rebellion against social norms, green and more, Different publications, 103 and 61. These two writers also would be in our bibliography. And again, this is summarized. It's Remember we talked about summary and um, paraphrase. Uh, this is kind of a summary or paraphrase. And so we don't put direct quotations, but we still have to give credit because we're using their ideas. Citing sources. So here's what a sources cited page would look like. Um, it's double spaced. The first line is to the margin. These are indented. And you notice you include the author the title, the source. In other words, what was this in a book? Was this in a journal? Was this in a magazine? Where was the source of website and the date? Basically, if you have that information, there's lots of other details and the book says more about this, but if you have that basic information, you're in probably in good shape. There are also places online where you can put all the information in. They're called, if you just Google MLA citation generator, there's lots of places that'll help you with that. Now you still probably want to check it. I don't know how good those are. I don't use them, but I know they're available out there. And I have nothing against them. I just don't, I don't write a lot of research papers these days. Um, so doc, document design, part one. So just really quickly, a couple of parts of document design. We talked about this a little bit, but your layout of your class for our class, again, use MLA style, indent the first lines of the paragraphs, double space. And in other classes, ask your professors how they want it formatted. We talked about the fonts and typefaces. There's lots of them. Times New Roman, Garamond, Century, Bookman Old Style. These are all, they all look pretty nice pretty good, but you can be the judge of that as long as it looks reasonable and it's easy to read. But I would use 12 point font. Sometimes you're gonna use 10 or 11. Um, and again, just check with your instructor. Uh, headings, if you wanna provide visual signposts for your reader, headings can help with this. So you may wanna add some headings. 
And sometimes you bold or italicize those headings to distinguish them. That's up to you if you want to include that. If your paper's longer in particular, that's usually a good idea. Lists and examples. Many writers use bullets, numbers, or letters to highlight lists and examples. So again, if you have a list you want to include in the middle of your paper trying to make a point, you can use those uh, bullets and so on. Color can be used sometimes sparingly. Don't use it too much. And think about what your, you know, whatever subject you're in. If they have something that says you can't do that, then obviously you don't want to. Who's your audience and purpose? What are you trying to use these colors for? Um, use of colors can draw attention to headings or other visual elements, such as like if you have a graph or a chart or something. And finally, visuals. When used purposely, tables, charts, and graphs can add a lot to your argument. So think about that. Um, we're going to talk about one way you can add a chart or a graph later in the semester. So I know that was a lot of information. I, I dumped a lot out there, and I apologize if that was too much. Um, but again, I did want to say something about this because it's really important just the way you format your paper. Um, and again, quoting and, and using summaries and using sources is very important. We want to avoid plagiarism. I'll keep bringing this up as we go through the semester. It's something we'll review, um, but hopefully uh, that's helpful. And I will stop there. If you have any questions, send me an email or visit my office hours. Thanks.